Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you on this very, very wet day. But I'm so glad that we're all together and that we're going to welcome the Spirit of God here this morning. So, yeah, I just invite you to stand with us and get ready.
Good to see you this morning. It's great that you're with us here at Harbour Church and we really want to give you a warm welcome. Trust that you'll feel at home with us today. Do you know, I wanted to stand up here as we're singing this song and say, Happy Easter. And I thought, I can't do that. It's nearly Christmas, but I'm going to do it anyway. Happy Resurrection Sunday. That's like half of you, half of you, that, for half of you that landed. Do you know, every day is Resurrection Day. Like, I'm, I'm just, come on. I'm hearing you, Dave, but I want to hear more of you every day. So I want to say it again, Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Because I don't know about you, but this morning I'm worshipping Jesus Christ, who not only died for me, but he rose again for me. He conquered death. And his life lives in me. His life lives in you. And this morning, would you allow me just to lead us all in prayer? In fact, why don't we just right now, maybe you just want to even open up your arms just as a symbolic way of just saying, Jesus, I want to welcome you into every part of my being. I love the line of this song that says, by your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. Why don't you just breathe right now? Why don't you just say those words, Jesus, by your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for resurrection life. And I want to pray right now for every single one of us that is here, from the youngest to the oldest, that in this place today, we would know resurrection life at work in the core of our beings. Oh God, that we would know the breath of God breathing into those dry, barren areas of our life. Breathing life, breathing healing and wholeness. Lord Jesus, we want to declare over our situations right now, Happy Easter. He is risen. He is alive. Come on, would you say that with me? He is alive. He is alive. God, I want to pray right now for those of us who are struggling to say that that we would know the reality of it, that you are alive. You are alive. You are alive. Lord Jesus, as we continue to worship you this morning, as we celebrate your resurrection, as we celebrate your life in us, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would enable us to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Lord Jesus, I pray that in this place, we would encounter you in a fresh and living way. Jesus' name. Let's continue to worship, shall we? Thank you, Lossie.
Jesus, my heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing.
to sing the same words that so many people were shouting as you came into Jerusalem. But it was really weird that we picked this song and then you said the thing about Easter. Um, because we picked it and I was like, we shouldn't say Hosanna on this, it's Easter time. <laughs> but actually, that's so not true. But yeah, it's he's the same yesterday and today and forever, that every day is resurrection day. We just take our seats but I wonder if we could just sing this again Hosanna Hosanna I was in a prayer meeting recently and, and and somebody said this word Hosanna and they said it with such conviction God saves he's the one who saves why don't we just sing this again this refrain Hosanna Hosanna and as you sing it why don't you invite and welcome the God who saves into your life right now. God, I welcome you. I want to sing Hosanna, the God who saves. Thanks, Lottie. Let's just keep singing this. Hosanna. break bread together in a... I just think this is a wonderful moment for us to pray a prayer like David prayed. Psalm 51, David said these words, create in me clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. He goes on to pray, God, I want to know the joy of my salvation. Restore to me. Let me come back to that place where I'm so beautifully and intimately in love with you and I don't know where you're at this morning but I want to invite you into that place as we break bread today where you can use this moment this moment within your week to say God would you come and do a restoration work within me like, here's the truth we all need that right I need that I can't get through an hour without needing that that's my confession I need Jesus constantly constantly just to come and just to renew me and restore me and this morning I want the table to be this wonderful place of exchange where we just say God as I break bread this morning as I take a piece of bread to remind me of your death for me Jesus I receive your life I receive your forgiveness I receive your wholeness creating me a clean heart I love that expression when, when David says and yeah, create a right spirit within me. I, I don't know about you, but for me, it just conjures up this sense of God. Everything, anything that's out of place, would you just put it back into place? That's the image I get. I've never been to a, do you call them a chiropractor? Somebody help me. Yeah, yeah. Whenever they put everything all back in, I've never done that. I probably should. <laughs> Although I understand it's a bit painful. Is it great? Is it great? 
But I've always just got that picture this morning. Would we allow God just to come and... Does it sound like that? I just kind of made that up. I'm just making it up as I go along. I don't know what I'm saying. Do we trust him? Did you break bread this morning? Could you just allow him just to go... I think that's what David's praying when he says, would you just put me right? I think that's what he's saying. God, put me right. I found myself crying out to God over something in my life this week and almost saying to God, it's not fair. It's not fair. And and in that moment, I just heard him say to me again, yeah, but Sarah, it's not fair according to how you see something. But actually, if you're coming to alignment with how I see it, then you'll see it is fair. That's called faith. Does anyone hear me this morning? And so often we're over here saying, God, put me right according to how I think it should be. Yeah? You hearing me? And God says, would you just take a sidestep and just dare to say, no, God, put me right according to how you think. And I want to tell you, from my own experience, that's really hard. You're looking at someone that is daily journeying that, and I don't find it easy. And I just reckon neither do you. And if you do, would you come and tell me how you do it? Because I could do with a bit of advice. I think we do it at the table. I think we do it at this place of faith where we go, but God, you know when the disciples said to Jesus, where else can we go? Like you alone have the words of eternal life. And I think that's the core of our being that says, Jesus, I can keep trying to do it on my own or I come into alignment with you and I discover real life. I'm going to trust you, Jesus. So as we break bread today, would you let that just be your prayer, your cry? Erin, you said to me in the week that maybe your connect group would help us serve. I don't know if that has been communicated, but if anyone's in Erin and Sam's connect group and would like to help us, um, I don't know if anyone's here from Erin and Sam's connect group. I mean, Sam's here. I don't even know who's in your connect group, Sam. Sam's going, I'm here. He did. You should have heard Aaron in the week. He went, I think my group should do it. I think my group should do it. Is anyone here? Come on, hands up. Are you in Aaron's group? Come on. If you're in Aaron's group, don't be shy. Aaron has volunteered you this morning. And uh, I think they deserve a little clap on their way up here, don't they? Because they didn't even know this was going to happen. You know? It's fine, Aaron. Don't worry at all. But honestly. No, there isn't. But you know what? I like this. This is family. We're just serving one another. So it actually doesn't matter. And if there's not enough, let's grab somebody else. And um, now my confession is there's only three baskets. So we'll obviously have one basket here, one basket there. The other one, we'll have to do that side and that side. So is that all right? Can you just work that, work that one out? Lord Jesus. Come on, should we just pray together? Lord Jesus, we, we want to come into alignment with you. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. Oh, make me right, Jesus. Make me right. According to what you say, not according to what I say, but according to what you say, Jesus. Jesus, I want to be right. And here's the beautiful miracle. He makes us right because of Jesus. You can't do it on your own, but he makes you right. So my friends, receive the bread and receive the cup this morning and receive his grace and receive his life be whole know the shalom of God be whole in Jesus name
just been um, sat here and just before this song came on, I just had two words going round and round. The words were stop striving. And I've kind of sat there just having a chat with God going, okay, I need a little bit more than that, God. <laughs> what do you mean by that? And, and, and in part, I still don't really fully know. But I just feel like I need to just bring those words and say stop striving. And even in context of just them last singing this word, that's what it means to then go, I'm going to fight this battle on my knees because I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to stop striving this. I'm going to stop battling this myself. What are you striving for? And as I've sat here, I just, I remember quite a few years ago, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I don't know if anyone else can resonate with that. And I remember God really speaking to me and saying, stop striving for perfection. Strive to do it with me. What are you striving for that maybe has taken that place that is higher? Are you striving? I sometimes can strive for perfection more than actually Jesus. And I just, maybe as we just sing this, my prayer is this, Holy Spirit, will you just speak to each one of us as to what that means? Stop striving. Stop striving. Let's fix our eyes on him. The battle, whatever it is. We do it on our knees. It's a surrender, saying, okay, I'm going to stop striving for this, God. <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. Maybe we could just sing this chorus again. And um, yeah, just allow God to just work that into you. song's really been on my heart for a long time. Um, as most of you might know, um, my wife's pregnant, which is amazing and a miracle in itself, which is fantastic. And as soon as she got pregnant, this song has been on my heart because I like, I worry a lot. I panic a lot. I try and do things in my own strength so many times. But since this song's been on my heart, every time I think about our baby and everything that's growing inside and the breath that God keeps breathing every day, it really encourages me to stop and listen and let it be with him. And I haven't worried since. And my wife can think of this, she might be still worrying, but I'm not. I know what God's got and God's got the plans. You just gotta listen to him and give it to him. It's hard, it's not easy, but you gotta give it to him. Get on your knees and pray this song because this song is God's word. Just, yeah. And when I fight, so where? We're going to sing this one more time, but before we do, Kathy, just come and just share. I love it when the Holy Spirit is just highlighting the same thing again and again. Thanks, Kathy. Hello, yes. Um, I've, I've been sitting wondering whether to give this word, and, and especially after MJ spoke. And, um, I've just had this phrase really saying that without, without death, there is no resurrection and of course um, our lovely Lord showed us that didn't he in the flesh and that's not 
his death on the cross isn't what we're talking about for ourselves. But if we want to see his resurrection life and that laying down, that battle on our knees, uh, so at some level there's a death to our own way of doing things and our own wisdom and our own strength. Um, who wouldn't want to see the Lord? I can't remember the words exactly, but who wouldn't want to see the Lord battling, going out in battle? So please embrace what we're saying today. Jesus. Well, Miss Falk, Kathy, you were going to say embrace death. Because <laughs> I think that's the message, right? Embrace death. The dying to ourselves that we might know his life at work in us. Jesus. Come on, when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. Just sing it one more time. On my knees. My hands lifted high. Jesus, Jesus. to know that there is power in your song, There's power in your declaration, and it's, it's great that we gather together on a Sunday morning like this, and if you're joining us at home, wherever you are, it's great that we come together, but what about tomorrow morning, what about Tuesday morning, what about Wednesday morning, what will your song be then, I love Dave's story, every day this is his song, let's find our song, let's make it a declaration, let's make our declaration, Jesus, I'm tucking under you, I'm aligning to you and your truth. Amen. 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 Wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We show our appreciation to our musicians this morning, and I just really want to thank you. It's brilliant. Why don't you just, just say hello to the people sitting around you? Why don't you just do that? Why don't we just, just use this moment to pause just bless somebody, say it's good to see you, it's good that you're here. In just a moment, we'll let our children go. You've got a new sheet, hopefully you've got a new sheet. Maybe give me a wave if you've got a new sheet and if you haven't, get one at the door. Um, all the information that you need for what's happening is in there. I guess there's just a couple of things I want to highlight. One of them is that this Wednesday evening at Cheriton Baptist Church, there is a Churches Together prayer meeting for the persecuted church and there's gonna be a guest speaker, pastor, I think it's called Ching Chong, I don't know, I don't know. Read it in the bulletin because I can't pronounce his name. Ching Tuk, Gareth's saying to me. Anyway, but we, we, a pastor from northern Nigeria is going to be with us here in Folkestone um, and he's going to be speaking firsthand about the persecuted church there in Nigeria and what's happening. So if you happen to be free on Wednesday night, and, um, and yeah, I'd really encourage you to go along to that meeting. I think we'll hear a powerful message. Um, and, and it will help us and inform us as churches together here in Folkestone as, as to how to pray. So I just want to highlight that. Um, I'm very aware that um, in a couple of weeks' time, we've got a quiz night here, haven't we, Eddie, for, uh, for Tear Fund, which is just brilliant. I mean, Tear Fund is an amazing charity. If you don't know about it, go and Google it. But, like, I, I honestly can't think of a better charity that we could be supporting right now. This is a national quiz night that's going to be happening. So it's not going to be Eddie rocking up with a bunch of questions, although that might be good. I'm not knocking you, Eddie, but, you know, might be good. But it's not like quiz night with Eddie. 
I'm right in saying that, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's all on the screen, isn't it? And isn't it? we're kind of joining in with the nation. There might even be some famous faces, is that right? I don't know, I haven't got a clue, but I just know it's like a big national quiz. Um, and the idea is, is that you come with a team, with some friends, and, and we're just going to have a great fun evening here. And, and hey, I guess there's big prizes to be won. Don't know, but yeah, big prizes. So 19th of November, stick that date in your diary and, um, and be here if you can and spread the word, stick it on Facebook, social media. Let's let people know. Another little date for your diary. Uh, Josh and myself are in the process of just talking about this and working it through, but oh, quick, remind me of the date. Friday the 9th. I think it's the 9th. Friday the 9th of... I can't remember what month it is. Um, anyway, whatever it is, the second weekend of December, we are going to be letting you know really, really soon um, about a Christmas event that's going to be happening here and, um, and just a festive evening that we're going to be doing for the community and uh, just loads of fun and, and, and just kind of welcoming our community into an indoor sort of mini fun day, um, music and song and games and quizzes and all kinds of stuff like that as we sort of kick off Christmas and, um, and then, yeah, we're going to roll out some dates coming up this week about other Christmas activities and events that are happening. So, so yeah, just bear that in mind and we will certainly let you know over the coming days dates that are going to be coming out. Shall we pray together before we just listen to God's word? Why don't we just begin to prepare our hearts? Should we just do that right now? Just say, Lord Jesus, in this place, we really want to hear from you. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I want to pray that you would just continue to speak to us in the way that you have. I want to thank you, Lord, that we've already been hearing you through the words we've been singing and the prophetic words that have been spoken this morning. And I just want to pray, Jesus, that as we continue to sit under your word now, that we would just have ears that are open and hearts that are open to hear from you. I thank you that your word changes us. It changes lives. And so, Lord Jesus, we're expecting that this morning that will be the case. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gareth. Let's welcome Gareth, shall we, as he comes. Well, I think hold that date the 9th likely. Sarah was supposed to phone Josh last night and tell him that there's a World Cup quarterfinal that day, and she didn't. It might be on the 2nd. <laughs> Great. Um, we've been uh, looking at Daniel the last... A uh, few weeks, month or so, whatever. And um, so maybe you can open your Bible if you've got it to Daniel. Uh, but um, really looking at how did he manage to, um, to live a life of integrity and a life of, um, uh, uh, you know, standing up boldly for his faith and yet be gentle and gracious and loving to his community and not cause offense where he was and he lived for around about 60 years in the top level of government of Babylon after being captured from Israel and taken and put through their training and all that and he lived for about 60 years in the top level of government while being able to stand for his faith. And so we've been looking at that. We've seen how culture tries to uh, take away our identity. We've seen how culture tries to stop us worshipping. And was there another one? I can't remember what I'm talking about now. But today I just want to talk about how culture distracts. How culture distracts. So I want to um, read to you from Daniel chapter 5. Uh, we're going to start at verse 1. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but this is the story. So uh, last time we were looking at Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the, is, the, uh, is the king of Babylon. He is arrogant and proud, and that's what we talked about last time, the culture of pride and sin and how that distracts. But um, his son, Belshazzar, who reigned alongside him as regent for a while, so we're not quite sure of the timings of all of this, but this story is about him. So Daniel has served Nebuchadnezzar through however many years that was. And uh, he's still there as an advisor, if you like, in government. But it seems like Belshazzar is not... Uh, he, he's not in Belshazzar's uh, uh, circle, if you like. So we're going to read from uh, 
Daniel 5, chapter 1. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cup that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the kings and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster, on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest rulers in the kingdom. And the, it goes on to describe how none of them could read the writing. And then his mum, she said, you need to get Daniel because she remembered. You need to get Daniel. And so they went to get Daniel. She remembered what he had done for Nebuchadnezzar. She remembered the dream's interpretation. She knew that he heard from God. What a good thing that is when you're in crisis. Call for the person that hears from God. That's an aside, but take it if it applies. <laughs> Verse 13. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, "Are you Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, by, brought, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you, and you're filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have, time, have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I'm told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you'll be clothed in purple robes of royal honor and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I'll tell you what this writing means. Your majesty, the most high God gave sovereignty, majesty, glory and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those who wanted to kill and spared those who wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. Over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself, for you've proudly defiled the Lord of heaven. You've had these cups from his temple brought before you, you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Mini, mini, tekel and parsin. This is what these words mean. Meaning means numbered. God has numbered the, the days of your reign as and brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You've been weighed in the balance and, not fa and have not measured up. Parsin means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. It's a long passage to read, but um, you know that story? That's one of those that we used to learn in Sunday school. <laughs> but this morning, as we just have read those verses, you know, we see 
Belshazzar is, is like his father, not humbled himself, but Nebuchadnezzar knew and was humbled, and yet Belshazzar brought those sacred cups in and drank from them and worshipped not the God that they were dedicated to, not Jehovah, not Yahweh, but his own gods made of silver and gold. And therefore, God brings this against him. If you uh, listen to Radio Church this morning, you'll recognize a few things that I speak about right now. But um, that was all in five minutes, and this is not going to be in five minutes. So uh, last weekend, last Sunday, Alice and Lib were driving back to uh, Worcester from here. They got to the M26, and as they were driving, a wheel came off a van in front of them and on the road, and they ran over it. And uh, Sarah came to me at the church again. She said, there's been an incident. And I'm like, what? A wheel came off, and I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, eventually got to the point, but uh, uh, it could have been much worse. Actually, all that happened was it lay on the ground. They ran over it. Two of the tires on the car were destroyed, and that was it. So it was an easy fix. No one was hurt. But when things like that happen, you think, what could have happened? What if that tire had bounced instead of lying on the road? What if it had gone through the windscreen? Uh, you know, those things. Actually, this last 10 days in our family, Amy's hit a curb and destroyed a tire. Ellis and Lib had been in an accident on the motorway. And last night, somebody drove into the back of Sarah. So <laughs> it's not been a good time the last couple of weeks. But that makes you think, doesn't it? A moment of crisis. A moment where you think, what if? And that's what is happening here to uh, Belshazzar. Someone's writing on the wall. Imagine that. A hand appears and starts writing on the wall. You would be freaked out. <laughs> Belshazzar was freaked out. And uh, these moments are the moments that cause us to reflect on our life. And that is exactly what was, God was doing with Belshazzar. And this morning I want to challenge us to take those moments to reflect before we get to the place Belshazzar's got to, which is in rebellion against God. You know, the first thing that comes to mind when you have a crisis moment, like what could have happened... Maybe it was danger to yourself, maybe someone in your family, whoever it was. The first thing that comes to mind is, am I ready to meet my maker? Am I ready to meet Jesus? And uh, I am confident that I am. I hope you are. If you're not, you can be. I'm confident that I'm ready. I've put my trust in Jesus to forgive my sin, to cleanse me, and I've declared both inwardly and publicly that Jesus is my Lord. I'm confident that when I make Jesus, I've been adopted as his son. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I've chosen Jesus as my route to the Father. And if you haven't, then you need to. And I want to encourage you to do that right now. Hopefully, as we broke bread together, you've already done that. But come before Jesus and say, God, forgive me, a sinner. I put my trust in you as Lord and Savior. And when we do that, we're adopted as his children. And I'm not preaching about that this morning, but it's important that we do, that we know. Am I ready? So the first thing before anything else to examine in our life, am I ready? But that's just me challenging you all. But there's more this morning. Because actually what Daniel says to Belshazzar is, your days are numbered and you're responsible for them. This writing on the wall, we, we have this common phrase in English, when the writing's on the wall, that means it's the end and it's going to end badly, doesn't it? And it comes from here. I don't know if, I mean, the words we have in the Bible, meaning, meaning, or tekel, parsing are Hebrew words. I don't know if they were Hebrew on the wall, and Daniel just read them, or if he had an, a, 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 a supernatural interpretation of what God had written. I don't know, but obviously he wrote it in Hebrew, so that's what we've got. 
Belshazzar is partying his life away. He's got loads of responsibility. He's got loads of stuff that he should be doing. That he should have followed the example of his father who, who, who started, you know, quite well. Middle part, really bad. Eventually repented and turned to God and said, he is the God of heaven. Belshazzar wasn't following that way. And so this, this, this writing on the wall brings him to that moment. Your days have numbered. Your, you've been weighed and found wanting. Your kingdom will be divided. This is a moment forced on him. And it's too late for him to do anything. The Medes and the Persians are already on their way. They're at the city gates already. If you look at the history, you can see that. But what about us? What about the moment of crisis? What happens when something challenges us? How do we react? When someone gets ill, we reflect, how am I using my life? What's important to me? The most common response to that is people and God. And the stuff doesn't really matter. When push comes to shove, when everything, your back's against the wall and actually the important things to us are the people around us, the people we have influence over, and are we right before God? And most of us don't care what car we're driving or, you know, what carpet is in our lounge or whether our TV is 32 inch or 52 inch. Because it brings us a new perspective. So this morning I want to just bring that challenge. You, me, our days are numbered. They're short. And there are two attitudes that we see in life, in the Bible. Belshazzar's got the first one of them. Eat, drink and be merry. Luke 12 has got the similar one. There's a rich man. He's partying away and God says, you fool. Tonight... I'm calling you home. In Hebrews, we see this verse, and it's the opposite view in a sense. It is destined for man once to die, and then the judgment in Hebrews chapter 9. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, we, we, we're going to face Jesus. We have to prepare for then, not for now. It's about long term. And if I were to ask you all, in the room which one is you is it eat drink and be merry or is it I'm giving myself for the kingdom of God well I know what you all know you should say <laughs> I think I know what you would all say and most of us would say we want to build the kingdom of God I hope all of us would say we want to build the kingdom of God but here's the deal that's not the culture we live in the culture around us is not that culture. It's about living for the moment. It's about, you know, eat, drink and be merry. It's about enjoying the moment and, and who knows, there's no eternal thinking in our world's culture. And so though me, we might say, I'm building the kingdom of God, every pressure on us is to conform to the culture of this world. The same that we've seen, the pressure that culture puts on us about our identity, about our worship, about uh, sin and pride and all of that that rises up. But it's also true of our focus in life. Our culture wants to shift us away from building the kingdom of God and push us towards eat, drink and be merry. Wasting our lives on the moment rather than the long term, than the future. And that's what our culture does. It would try to distract us. And that's what Satan wants. You'll have heard probably many times that illustration given by a professor at a university about organizing your life. And he brought in like a bucket or something and he had some rocks and some stones and some water and, and he said and he got the students to tell him how to put in and, and, and basically you know if you put in the sand if you put in the water first there's no space for the big rocks 
But if you put the rocks in first, you can fit other stuff around, but you'll never get the big things in if you don't, if you don't put them in first. You'll never get them in if you don't put them in first. And so we have to say, what are my priorities in life? What are the big things? What are the very few things that I cannot dispense with? And it's time for an audit. It's time to say, what are the big things in my life? What are the things that I cannot dispense with? And start to make them first in your priorities. Other stuff comes around it. They're not bad. But you won't fit the, the priorities if you don't put them first. Where does my time go? Where does my money go? Where do my personal resources go? My mental and emotional energy. What am I spending on? What am I spending them on? So our lives, our, our days are numbered. And then, of course, Daniel says to Belshazzar, your life has been weighed. And in his case, it was found to be out of balance. It was found to be wanting. Of course, in those days, the scales would have been the, the ones with a weight on one side. And the, you understand what I mean. Hopefully, my hands are telling you what I mean. I don't know how to explain it. It's a balance. So actually, his life is out of of balance so our days are number but we are responsible for how we use them how am I using the days that I have been given <laughs> I've got to confess there are too many days when I look on Facebook and I get caught up with those stories about bad customer service or and you scroll down for you know somebody in a restaurant did this and that and the other and, and half an hour has gone and I think what have I done what have I done you know your phone I've actually accidentally left my phone at home this morning that may be a good thing your phone is a distraction machine it literally beeps at you to distract you it comes up with reminders and prompts and all this business. And it's blimmin' Facebook and WhatsApp and Messenger and texts and... Oh. It's a distraction machine. It reminds you to be distracted. But every one of us has more important things in our life than time spent on Facebook or time spent at work or whatever social media platform you use or whatever that might be. If we were to eliminate everything, if we were to eliminate everything that doesn't matter, there should be two categories remaining, God and people. And there's a question that you might be scared to ask but what will will what I'm doing matter a hundred years from now will anyone remember me hundred well they might not but actually stuff you do now can change their lives then they might not know who you are but you might influence the person that influences them Hebrews 11 verse 39 and 40 it's it's um it's that long list of the men and women of faith. And then verse 39 and 40, I paraphrase, it says, they died without seeing their promise fulfilled. Oh, there we go, it's on the screen. All of these people, oh, it's gone again. <laughs> they died without seeing their promise, the promise of God revealed in their life. That's a challenge, isn't it? But they had sowed themselves, and they're in this list of people that we remember because they sowed themselves into the kingdom of God. However, remember there's some scales involved here. This is about balance. Because I've seen people become so obsessed with the kingdom of God and serving the kingdom of God that they become useless for everything. Because they, 
burn themselves out to the point where they are not able to do what God has called them to do. So what I, I just want to, you know, I, I am absolutely committed and convinced that my life should be spent serving the kingdom of God and the people that are in it. But for me to do that, I have to be sensible in the way that I live. We have a, a, a phrase uh, often spoken at halftime when, uh, uh, when I'm playing rugby, leave everything on the field. Actually, at halftime, somebody said to me yesterday, you look like you've had a stroke. <laughs> I was, it was one of those moments where I had just run and I was trying to catch my breath. But there we go. But we say, leave everything on the field. And what we mean is, and you've probably heard that expression, we mean is, don't have any energy left at the end of the game. Don't regret. But here's the thing about an athlete, and I'm not that. But <laughs> they spend themselves on the pitch, but when they come off, they have a plan to recover. They spend themselves on the pitch, but when they come off, I have never done this but I've seen people do it. They get in a wheelie bin filled with water and ice for 20 minutes. About five or six years ago, at the end of every match, there was always like a couple of wheelie bins full of water and ice. And all these guys would be getting in. And they're like, are you getting in? And I'm like, I, it must have been about 10 years ago. I'm 40 years old. I've not been in an ice bath and I'm not starting now. But here's the thing. There's a plan to recover. There's a plan to rebuild energy. And that means, you know, for some people getting in an ice bath, it means eating protein to rebuild your muscles. It means resting. If you're a professional athlete, you probably get massages and all that stuff to recover so that next time you go on the pitch, you're ready. And there's something about us and the kingdom of God. is We can spend ourselves till we're useless and I bet we all know what that's like. You, you, you get so tired that you work hard all day and you get to the end of the day and nothing's happened. Because you spent yourself so much that actually, you know, your effort is in vain because you are not productive. And, and when it comes to the kingdom of God, we've got to have a balance here. We have to give ourselves to build in the kingdom, but we have to do it sensibly. And I'm only saying this because the danger of me preaching what I'm preaching this morning is, Gareth said we've got to spend ourselves for the kingdom. And next week or next month, you'll be useless for anyone. So, so do it wisely. <laughs> it comes to what are the priorities? Am I putting the big things in? Am I, my days are numbered, am I using them? For what they were meant for. If every moment is spent on mission, we will burn out. I've really lost myself in my notes. <laughs> you know, Belshazzar heard your kingdom is divided. I don't want us to get there. Don't want any one of us to get there. To the point where it's too late. You know, when it comes to rest, recuperation, as we've been talking about, here, here, here's the question that really matters, I think. Is this a distraction? Is this distracting me for the kingdom of God and my leisure time? Or is it preparing me? Is it restoring me? Is it building my strength? Is it building my spirit, my emotion? Because that's what it should be doing. Too often it becomes a distraction to what we are called to do. You need to be rested to build the kingdom of God, but you don't need to be distracted. But if you don't rest, you're in danger. I'm going back to my notes because I've got so distracted by it, distracted myself. Burnout leads to ruined lives. When you're tired, when you're spent, these things, you're vulnerable to sin. Satan knows. Sarah spoke about Elijah the other week. He's spent himself spiritually and emotionally in a battle with 400 others and he goes off and hides in a cave because he's afraid he says there's only one of me God speaks the truth to him but that's the moment of vulnerability he's tired 
he's, he's given of himself. When you are tired and spent, your emotions are inconsistent. You're easily overwhelmed. You become unproductive. I said just now, I can spend the whole day working and at the end of the day think, what have I done? It's because I'm burning out. It's because I'm overspent. My, my time is not spent usefully. It's just spent. You can't hear God. When you're spent, you don't hear God. What to do? Take a Sabbath. Take days off. Rest. Recuperate. Recover. Get in a place to hear from God. Eliminate other voices. I read something I want to recommend. I'll put it over here. Lots of what I've been speaking on the last week is from this book, The Daniel Dilemma. I recommended it a couple of weeks ago. I want to recommend it again. Josh has put his thumbs up. Jim bought it as well. So if you want to read it and you don't want to buy it, borrow it from Josh or, Josh or Jim. <laughs> Great book. I recommend it to you. Um, but he, Chris Hodges wrote in this book, experience is not the best teacher. We hear that, don't we? Experience is the best. He said, evaluated experience is the best teacher. You can only really learn if you ask yourself, what did that mean? Just to conclude with this morning, I wrote here on my notes, you need a midlife crisis. <laughs> For those who didn't hear that, Aaron said, what, another one? <laughs> but here's the thing, you need a moment to stop you in your tracks. For, for, for Belshazzar, it was, it was writing on a wall. It might be somebody drives into you in your car, whatever it might be. It's, it's a moment where you think, am I using my life in the best way? Am I doing well? Have I been distracted? Is other stuff getting in the way? Am I too burnt out to be effective? And this is where uh, uh, Josh is... Radio Church has finished my preach off for me. He sent me the scriptures and I thought, oh, that's the one to conclude with. Um, what, uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. Actually, we'll read verse 6. Let's read both. 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, it says, uh, it, it is Paul writing to Timothy, who's a, a young pastor of a big church. He said, I remember your genuine faith for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flame the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God had given, not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Paul writes to Timothy, who's in ministry, and says, fan into flame the gift in you how easy for us to let things die down to let the flame settle to not give it the oxygen it needs <clears throat> how easy for us to neglect feeding the fire and it's still there but it's not what it should be So Paul says, fan it into flame. Somewhere else it says, stir it up. Peter writes in 1 Peter, prepare your mind for action. Oh, I love that. <laughs> prepare your mind for action. 1 Peter 1 verse 20 something, I think. It's after that fantastic bit where it describes our salvation and all this stuff. And he says, therefore, because of what God has done for you, Prepare your mind for action. Get yourself ready. And I want to just challenge every one of us, probably me, first and foremost, to take a moment this week to evaluate 
Have you got the big stuff in first? What's the important stuff? What is distracting you? Get rid of it. What's, what leisure activities are doing are preparing you and what are distracting you? You know, we should not be struggling as a church for volunteers to run stuff. There's loads of us here. We should be fighting you off, having to create new ministries. I'm just going to leave that there. (laughs) But take the time today, this week, to evaluate, eliminate, ask yourself, is what I'm going to do going to have an effect on somebody's life in 100 years from now? My kids' kids, their friends, the churches that we build, the, the ministries that we start, the legacy that we leave. And is what I'm doing about God and people or is it about stuff? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace to us. Father, we, th- we, we, we know, I know, the times when I'm distracted by culture, distracted by the stuff around me, caught up with stuff that doesn't matter Father forgive us and help us to identify what it is that distracts and to focus our attention on you and the call that you have on our lives Father we pray that you would gently remind us Father we don't really want moments of crisis but that you would gently remind us to examine ourselves, to eliminate what should not be there. Father, I pray that you would just just minister in each one of us. As uh, uh, David wrote, see if there be any wicked way in me. Well, Father, more than that, see if there be any wasted stuff, distracted stuff. Father, just bring revelation to our hearts. But more than that, help us to take positive steps to do something about it. Father, we need your help because we're in a culture that fights against us. Father, help us to stand firm against it. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, lots for us to go away and and chew on, think upon there. Yeah, I would say don't wait for a crisis. Pray every day, God, search me, examine me, and uh, and teach me. I tell you what, if there's one man in our church that does spend himself on behalf of God and his kingdom, it's my father-in-law, Gerald Webber. Do you know he made the news this week? Uh, Did you know that? Yeah, come on, a little round of applause for you, Gerald. Gerald made the news because... He was out in that awful rain, clearing out the gutters, and it made Kent news. So there you go. Gerald, Harbour Church, we say thank you. Um, And I know he'd sit there going, oh, I'm just one of many. You are one of many, Gerald, but for this week, you're our hero. We think think you're you're amazing. So uh, let's all live like Gerald, yeah? Let's all be Gerald, that's what I think. Hey, God bless you all. Let's enjoy tea and coffee together. Let's, um, yeah, let's hang around, let's chat together, let's encourage one another, um, and let's have a great week, and uh, look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless you all.